All right, so um, by way of introducing this talk, I, I hope that you will forgive me by starting with a little story, an angry little story about myself and about my righteous rage as a newly act bisexual feminist. Uh, it was the mid-1990s, and I had just broken up with my boyfriend of seven years, declared myself bisexual, and I began excitedly reading personal ads in the weekly paper uh, in Santa Barbara, which is where I had also just started graduate school at the time. Now, I knew that Santa Barbara was no hotbed of queer life, and if you've been there, you'll know this also. Um, but I was disappointed to find few ads for women seeking women, and I felt even further thwarted and basically personally offended by the number of ads that unapologetically declared some version of no bisexuals need reply. How many of you have encountered the no bisexuals need reply sentence in the personal ad? Okay. Um, so shocked that I wasn't going to be immediately and lovingly embraced into women's beds, I did what any graduate student would do. I wrote a long and fiery rant about biphobia and submitted it as a seminar paper to uh, one of my faculty. And in response to the paper, my professor at the time offered an equally fiery set of comments in which he clarified the difference between scholarship and personal complaint. And uh, apparently my paper was an example of the latter and he just did not feel my pain. So, you know, there are a lot of different stories to tell about the politics of bisexuality, but the one I'm going to tell today begins in the mid-80s, a decade before my uh, own bisexual awakening. And I can imagine that those of us here agree that, um, you know, people have likely experienced bisexual desire since the dawn of humanity, the dawn of time. And many of us also know that bisexual people were active participants in um, homophile, gay liberation, and other sexuality movements that precede the period that I'm going to talk about today. But the reason that I'm focusing on the 1980s is because this period marks the emergence of what I consider to be the modern bisexual identity movement in the United States. And if you read your pamphlet, you'll see that a case can be made that this movement begins in the 1970s. But the reason I'm going to focus on the 1980s is because this is when we get a broad-based movement that is diverse and inclusive. In other words, it's not simply uh, small groups of bisexual men, but, but a movement that also includes women and that includes, uh, that involves inclusive bisexual organizations. So in the early and mid-1980s, we see uh, a number of bisexual organizations are founded, like Byways in Chicago, uh, the Bisexual Resource Center in Boston, the San Francisco Bisexual Center, the Bisexual Forum in New York. And these organizations start to produce countless pamphlets and resource guides on the subject of bi identity that can be distributed to people. And we also see dozens of bi oriented um, social groups, political networks that emerge around the country in this period. <clears throat> and if you think about the political climate of the 1980s, it might come as a little surprise to us that this burst of bisexual organizing occurs in this period, which is also the height of extreme fear and misinformation about AIDS. How many of you are old enough to remember the 1980s and the AIDS epidemic, particularly the way that the media, I now teach to students who don't remember that decade, they were born in that decade, so it's good to be with people my age. Um, so, you know, and, and, and this is also a time of incredible misinformation, particularly about how HIV is transmitted. Um, and, you know, in the 80s when AIDS was believed by most people to be a, a gay disease that could uh, only threaten innocent heterosexuals if there was some kind of transmission that, that occurs from gay sex to straight sex, bisexual men became really at the center of AIDS panic in, in the United States, and particularly a panic around how is it that quote unquote innocent heterosexuals are getting uh, infected with AIDS uh, or HIV. 
countless news reports um, communicated to Americans that the only conceivable explanation for the appearance of AIDS among heterosexuals was that bisexual men were deceitful carriers of the disease. In other words, they were bringing HIV home to unsuspecting wives and girlfriends. And you see here on this slide an example of um, not only biphobic, but also very racist um, material pertaining, you know, carrying this message, don't catch AIDS, don't have sex with IV drug users, bisexuals, and blacks, and it says heterosexual black males are 14 times as likely as whites to be, to be HIV carriers. Um, so this is not an uncommon message during this period. Now, in addition to the media uh, vilification of bisexual men, bi people in the 1980s also found themselves really at this point needing to respond to the fears and reservations that had been brewing among gay men and lesbians uh, during and after the gay liberation period of the 1970s. Many bisexuals had experienced tremendous marginalization within gay and lesbian organizations in the 70s and early 80s. And it was in gay organizations that often bi people encountered the most resistance to the very um, idea of bisexuality, where they often encountered incredible um, resistance to the idea that bisexuality was uh, a sexual identity that, that people had a right to claim. Um, these tensions were especially pronounced for bisexual women who weathered some very painful accusations by lesbian feminists that they were fair-weather sisters or traitors to the feminist cause who would ultimately leave women for men and for the privileges that came with heterosexual relationships. So this is just a very brief sketch of the forces that converge in the 1980s to produce a political consciousness, a sense of urgency, and a sense of distinct um, identity uh, for many bi activists who start to recognize that they are not going to find a safe or a comfortable home in either gay or straight worlds. Now, what I find most interesting about this period is the way that bisexual activists respond to them by theorizing bisexuality or by defining it and articulating a set of bisexual concerns and demands that remain in our consciousness today. And to get us thinking about the content of the theoretical content of the bi identity movement, I'm going to draw heavily on what is arguably the manifesto of the modern bisexual identity movement, which is a book of essays called By Any Other Name, Bisexual People Speak Out. Does anyone have this book? Okay, so great, you know this book. So By Any Other Name was published in 1991, and um, it, had, it was edited by two bisexual activists named Lorraine Hutchins and Lani Kapumanu. And its basic take-home message was that bisexuality had been deeply misunderstood by um, gay men, lesbians, and heterosexual people alike, and that an accurate understanding of bisexual culture, bisexual community, bisexual um, identity must come from within bisexual communities themselves. In other words, if you want to understand bisexuality, you go to the source. You have to, have to actually talk to bisexual people. And this is a pretty classic social movement demand, right? So this book and this way of thinking about bisexual identity and politics that it represented was really groundbreaking. It made some essential interventions into biphobia. It also mobilized bisexual people who could now think of themselves as a community with a shared history and a collective political uh, future. But what I want to argue today is that the bisexual movement of the 1980s also made some counterproductive moves that have effects for the ways that most people think about or don't think about bisexuality today, 20 years later. And this, I want to be really clear that this is absolutely not to single out the bisexual movement because many of the exact counterproductive moves that I'm going to talk about were made by the mainstream lesbian and gay movement. And in fact, you could certainly argue that the mainstream gay lesbian movement kind of uh, led the charge in making these errors. Uh, but I want to talk about how these errors were made in the bisexual movement and what the implications of that um, are. And I want to 
suggests that these strategic choices account in part for the ways that bisexuality, bisexuality became relatively depoliticized and later viewed primarily as a sexual orientation rather than as a political stance or a framework of opposition to the heterohomo binary or more importantly, I think, to the gender binary. And as my talk unfolds, I'm going to argue that today we're, we're still grappling with the limitations of this earlier framework, even as we have some new tools for resisting it and for re-theorizing uh, gender and desire. So I want to move into talking about the central arguments um, that come out of the early bisexual pride literature, such as in books like By Any Other Name. Um, first, bisexual writing, I'm going to talk about three central themes. Bi bisexual writing in this period um, declared that bisexuality is a distinct and stable sexual orientation. This work of defining bisexuality as a distinct orientation often took the form of debunking a list of myths about bisexuality or kind of a myths and realities checklist where it was um, clarified that bi people are not in transition, are not in a phase, are not confused, are not denying their lesbian uh, or gayness, at least not any more than anyone else in the world might be doing these things. And instead, this literature proclaimed that bisexuality is a sexual orientation that's characterized by um, the potential for desire for either sex. This is the way that bisexuality gets defined in the book by any other name, for instance. Quote, the potential for desire for either sex, end quote. Bi activists or bi writers in this period declared that sometimes, sure, bisexuality is temporary, often it is lifelong. They explained that in many cases, uh, people have a preference for either the same or the opposite sex while recognizing their attraction to both. A little less clear or agreed upon in this literature is the relationship between bisexual identity and lesbian or gay identity. Um, many, on the one hand, many bi activists were uh, working against the notion that bisexuals are pre-gay or in denial about being gay. But on the other hand, they also described bisexuality as an, ident as an identity that, quote, incorporates gayness. And so here's um, a, a quote from By Any Other Name. Uh, quote, many bisexuals consider themselves part of the generic term gay, are quite active in the gay community, and some use terms such as bisexual lesbian to increase, to increase their visibility on both issues, end quote. So we get here the sense that bisexuality is a distinct orientation that is defined by potential desire. It's not transitional, but it can be temporary. Um, it often includes gayness, but it is more than gayness. Um, so, so you get a sense of, this, of the complexity here, and I'm going to bracket this complexity and I'm going to uh, return to it in, in a bit. A second theme that gets developed in bi-movement discourse in the 1980s is that contrary to the notion at the time that bisexuals benefit from heterosexual privilege, uh, bi activists argue that in fact they suffer from both homophobic and biphobic oppression. So bisexual writers explained that bi people struggle against the homophobic reactions that heterosexuals have to their queerness, and when they're in same-sex relationships, they suffer the same discrimination experienced by gay men and lesbians. But compounding these forces, bisexuals are also the subject of a distinct biphobia that's leveraged by both gay people and straight people. Um, and you know all of these stereotypes that bisexuals are characterized as, um, as fence sitters, as uh, promiscuous or sluts, as homewreckers, as cowards, people who can you know, hide in the heterosexual community when the going gets tough kind of thing. 